شكرا لوجود حضرتك معانا فيزيكال السنه دي ربنا يبارك فيكم وانا كمان والله انا كان نفسي اكون يعني ان شاء الله قريبا جدا ان شاء الله نلتقي باذن الله على خير كالعاده ان شاء الله باذن الله الله يا فندم. دكتور اسلام ابراهيم ويل توك اباوت انترناشونال اكسبيرينس ويت كوفيد 19 ريكابيتوليشن. ثانك يو سو ماتش. هل السلايدز كده واضحه ولا احط السلايد شو؟ ميبي اف يو بوت على السلايد شو هتبقى اوضح واكبر دكتور اسلام. يا ذيس از جريت. اوكي. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Of course, I like to thank the organizing committee with Dr. Adil Khattab, Dr. Tariq Safwat, and all the members. And I really miss you guys. I mean, I was very pleased to see you every year. And hopefully, we will have a better relationship in the future, inshallah. The talk is about COVID-19 international experience. And I tried to summarize the information from four different reputable sources. One of them is NIH. National Institute of Health in Washington, D.C., where Itani John Hopkins, well, hey, John Hopkins has been doing a great job keeping up uh, to date with all the developments in the field. And then the CDC, and lastly, WHO. Uh, this pandemic is not uh, the first pandemic humans see. Uh, at the turn of the 19th century, we had the Spanish flu, and now we're dealing with this virus that came out of China and then spread to the rest of the world uh, in no time. Um, we're not oblivious to coronaviruses. Uh, we know some of the coronaviruses that cause common cold. Uh, the problem is with these emerging uh, subtypes of coronaviruses that caused some of the uh, uh, epidemics and now the pandemic. First is MARS that came out uh, in, uh, uh, sorry, SARS that came out in 2003, and then the MERS that came out in 2009, and now the COVID-19 that came out in 2019. Basically, these are viruses that infect animals, and now they evolved to infect humans. Uh, as a matter of fact, the SARS virus uh, was uh, and you first diagnosed in the market that was selling these type of animals. I think they call them Chinese badgers. And then the, the MERS obviously can be traced back to contact with camels, and now COVID-19 is uh, traced back to bats. It is devastating that the numbers of COVID-19 continue to grow despite all the efforts. So obviously, in the absence of an effective agent to kill the virus and something to uh, vaccinate the population, and uh, some of the population is not taking it seriously. Unfortunately, in the US, uh, there is a big move of uh, the population that are resisting to wear masks. Uh, they say it's individual right for the person uh, not to wear the mask. And there have been some rallies where people didn't take precautions or social distancing. And when people were surveyed, the frustrating thing is almost half of them said they don't want to mask because they feel it's the right. It's the freedom to not to put a mask on. And the, as you can see, these rallies, they don't take any precautions. And that obviously reflected very badly on the country and on the world. And it's no surprise that the numbers are now exceeding the 13 million mark in the US. But with the new administration coming in January, I think uh, things will change in the US. So I think there's going to be a mandate for people to wear masks in public places, and there's going to be social distancing. And I think it's going to be enforced uh, somehow by law. Now, how is the rest of the world doing? Are we flattening the curve or not? In certain countries, especially those that live in the cold area, uh, there was a surge of uh, cases in November. Some of the countries started to bring the numbers down and others have not yet. Like you see, Russia continues to go higher, Italy up and then coming down, Germany continues to go up, United Kingdom up and then down. And you'll see that trend for most of the countries across the world. Now, some of the work that was done by the World Health Organization is to estimate how ready these countries are ready to deal with the pandemic. And um, there's good news and bad news. The good news is um, most of the countries, almost 90% of them, have the programs in place to prepare them to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. And almost all the countries now have the capability of testing as many patients or population uh, persons who need to be tested. So that's good news. The bad news is many countries had failed to maintain essential health services during the pandemic and also failed to control the ports of entry and have contingency plans of what happens if you get a large number of infected population through the port of entry. Only 35% of the countries are prepared that way. And also 
uh, and this is the most important and uh, pertinent to us, uh, that many of the countries have failed to put safety plans for healthcare workers. And that obviously poses a lot of danger to the front, uh, uh, front liners uh, like EMS, uh, nurses, doctors, and so forth. Uh, some of the pathological changes that happened with COVID, and uh, I don't want to, to give you like a full pathology uh, talk here, but uh, just to show the fact that the virus is not limited to one organ. Uh, these are the lungs that look so congested and hemorrhagic, as you see here. This is full-blown pleurisy, uh, pale areas and congested areas of the lungs, and then you have DVT and PE. Uh, Dr. Adil yesterday talked about thromboembolic manifestations um, in COVID-19, so I would not go into depth because he covered the topic very well. Uh, but in all autopsies, this was found universally. All of them had diffuse alveolar damage with the formation of hyaline membrane, as you can see here. Also, there's metaplasia and transformation of some of the alveolar lining cells and congestion of the alveolar capillaries with lots of inflammatory white cells inside the capillaries, indicating that there is intense inflammatory changes happening with this disease. Also fibrin deposits in the alveolar capillaries. This is acute bronchopneumonia. This is fibrosing, organizing pneumonia. This is a clot in the medium-sized pulmonary artery. And this is again congestion of the alveolar capillary with extraposition of red cells into the alveoli. Now, the disease is not limited to the lungs, as we said. It also causes pericarditis and myocarditis, as you can see here. There is intense inflammatory changes in the liver, congestion in the glomerulus in the kidney. Uh, these little dots here are hemorrhagic changes in the brain. And microscopically, there's a full-blown infarction here in the gray matter of the anterior lobe, hemorrhagic changes again in the brain. Now, what happens when the virus gains access into our bodies it is met with these guards, the macrophages and the dendritic cells, and both are antigen presenting cells. Their job is to digest whatever is in their way and present the antigen to the B cells and the T cells that undergo certain maturation with the release of a lot of cytokines. But this is also good and bad news. Good news in the term it is trying to combat the infectious agent, but bad news because we can develop a cyto kind storm that eventually ends up destroying our own tissues. So we'd be, we're between a rock and a hard place. Now, when patients come into the hospital nowadays, the standard of care has become remdesivir, dexamethasone, and obviously a lot of non-pharmacological support from oxygen to conservative fluid management to prone positioning and so forth. We'll talk about that very briefly. Um, patients can deteriorate very quickly. So if they are on oxygen, they need to be monitored very closely, uh, preferably in an ICU or step down area, because when they crash, they crash quickly and they need to be intubated. And obviously it happened to me a lot of times when people are going into the room to intubate and they don't have the full PPEs, it takes them time to find the N95 and then to put the mask and then to put the hood. Uh, and that obviously is not in favor of the patient. So they need to be monitored in areas where people are prepared and ready to go and all the equipments are ready. Uh, the prone positioning has been known for a long time to improve oxygenation by improving VQ matching. But uh, a warning here is if the patient is in distress and needs to be intubated right away, um, we should not be proning them just to avoid intubation because that's dangerous. People with abdominal surgeries, unstable spines and stuff are not good candidates for prone positioning. Pregnant ladies can still be proned in the left lateral decubitus position. Now, this is a beautiful machine here, the high flow uh, oxygen through a nasal cannula. We can go up on the flow to 60, 70, even 80 liters, which is a great tool maintaining oxygen saturation above 92, 93% as we need. And if that doesn't uh, help, then we have the option of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, whether it's CPAP or BiPAP. Now, I like this very much. I mean, the hood, because it contains the uh, aerosols coming out of the patient and limits the spread of infection, especially if it has these biological uh, filters. Now in intubation, we have to take lots of precautions. Uh, this is something that the physicians came up with, like a little plastic uh, hood or uh, even uh, glass. Uh, the idea is to try to limit the aerosolization uh, during the intubation and use fiber optics, obviously, rather than direct uh, laryngoscopy. Now, once the patient is on the vent, what are we gonna do? We will deal with the patient if they develop ARDS, like every other ARDS. I know there has been a talk in Italy, people with high compliance and low compliance and saying that COVID-19 ARDS is not the same as any other disease, but eventually I think it came down to this. ARDS is ARDS. 
we need to practice uh, long protective mechanical ventilation by low tidal volumes, limiting our peak plateau uh, pressures, and limiting our driving pressures. The studies had showed that the higher the PEEP, the lower the mortality, both in the ICU and in the hospital in general. So the whole idea is that we go up on the PEEP to try to limit our driving pressure, keeping the plateau below 30 and keeping the driving pressure is about 14 or less. So the same strategies as we do for every ARDS patient uh, in the ICU. Conservative fluid management, meaning we try to keep the lungs as dry as possible, but not to the point of depriving hemodynamics from good perfusing pressure. Uh, good practices on the vent, uh, and this is obviously known uh, to all of you, the recruitment maneuvers, uh, putting the patients on high peep for you know, 30, 45 seconds to try to recruit some of the collapsed alveoli. Uh, this curve here shows this is tidal volume, and this is compliance in blue, and green is peep. So this is a patient during a uh, recruitment maneuver, the peep is going higher. And then right after the maneuver, you see a big gain in data volume and improvement in compliance. So we do this a couple of times a day, but obviously keep in mind that they are not without risk complications as well. They can reduce uh, hemothorax or better trauma. When things are still bad and you're not able to control the patient, the, peak, the plateau pressure is still high and the patient is tachypneic and hypoxemic, then neuromuscular blockade uh, becomes an option. Obviously, we prefer the intermittent route rather than continuous, and no more than 24, 48 hours. Now, the preferred vasoactive agent is still norepinephrine for the management of hemodynamics. Now, routine use of ECMO is not advised for patients with uh, COVID-19 unless uh, they have the classic criteria of PF ratio less than 100, you know, failure of mechanical ventilation, despite you know, the prone positioning, the adjustment, and neuromuscular blockades, if everything fails, then they will be candidates for uh, ECMO. Uh, dialysis, if you have to dialyze patients, we prefer CRRT, again, minimizing the entry into the room. Uh, regular dialysis requires a nurse to be sitting there, and we don't want to prolong contact with the patients, if all possible. If CRRT is not available, then intermittent prolonged dialysis is the option. Now, the question is, how can we battle this disease? Do we have any drugs? And that's the next section here. Now, the thinking is, well, early in the disease, if it's mild, I'm trying to prevent the virus from getting into the cells or replicating itself inside the cells. So my focus is going to be on medications like, well, now it is no longer effective, but we mm -hmm. thought at that time hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, and we thought about remdesivir and things that would stop replication of the virus intracellularly. Now, later on, when the disease gets uh, you know, stronger or worse, now we're thinking that our immune system is co contributing to the uh, problem, and now we're thinking of immune suppressants. So this is the strategy of, uh, uh, of, of treatment. Now, when hydroxychloroquine came out, it was embraced by everyone, including President Trump, who said he was taking hydroxychloroquine and he advocated for it. And again, it was approved in so many countries, in China and in France, South Korea, in the Netherlands and Italy. So it was widely accepted. And in a study that was done in New York involving more than 1,300 patients admitted to New York hospitals between March and April, they found that 60% of those patients who admitted with COVID-19 received hydroxychloroquine. And I just uh, you know, made uh, a little fun here. This is a Statue of Liberty holding hydroxychloroquine here and holding hydroxychloroquine up there. Um, so the FDA, because you know we were desperate, they issued this temporary or emergency authorization uh, use. Uh, this is not a full approval, but it says it is okay to use it because there's nothing else that is working. And then, but we went in to study hydroxychloroquine in randomized controlled trials to see if it really helps hospitalized patients with COVID-19. And it was a, a good number of patients, you know, 1,500 in the intervention arm and almost 3,000 or more in the uh, placebo arm. And unfortunately, uh, we did not meet any of the primary or the secondary endpoints. It was devastating, and it was very clear that hydroxychloroquine did not do anything for hospitalized patients with COVID-19. As a matter of fact, there was a signal that patients who did not use hydroxychloroquine did a little bit better. So it was showing that hydroxychloroquine is actually worse. So that brought it to an end, and that, that authorization given by the FDA was revoked and taken back, and then the statement was hydroxychloroquine just does not work for sick patients hospitalized with COVID-19. But then the thinking was, okay, maybe we need to use it early on, because again, the way it works is it stops that S14 spike 
from you know, joining the receptor, AC2 receptor, and getting into the cell. So maybe we need to start early on before the virus gains entry into the cell. Maybe then we can prevent the infection. So we tried that for those who had been exposed, high risk exposure. Let's say you've been close to a person who turned out to have COVID. You didn't have the proper distance, less than two meters. You were not wearing a mask. You, you know, had a conversation with them for more than 10 minutes. That is the, uh, considered high risk exposure. So they said, let's try hydroxychloroquine on this population. And they did. Again, the results, again, were devastating and frustrating. It didn't really do anything preventing the disease. So hydroxychloroquine, we can conclude now that it is absolutely useless and maybe even harmful. So it is out of the picture. So we turn to something else. Okay, those who developed the disease and they made their own antibodies, maybe those antibodies are protective. So we can take the serum and give it to other people. Very simple uh, method that we've been doing for a long time. But again, put it to the trial. We have the randomized control trials and 220 patients on this arm that received the plasma, 105 placebo. And unfortunately, again, devastating results. No mortality benefit, doesn't shorten the disease, doesn't make the patients feel better or get better faster. So again, another failure. So we turn into the antiviral agents and we're trying to find an agent that would stop the the virus from replicating itself, you know, making copies inside the cell. And uh, we picked uh, agents that would work on the polymerase enzyme that helps the, uh, the uh, virus control transcription process in the cell. Uh, so this medicine, I believe, was available in Egypt a few months ago, um, Caletra, which is a combination of lopinavir, ritinavir. And um, again, it was promising. And I read a couple of papers from China that said that they had good results with it. Uh, but when it was put to the task, again, it proved not to be efficacious. And now another uh, agent into the basket. Now the ACT trial, there is ACT 1, 2, and 3. ACT 1 is chicken remdesivir alone. And it was a big study because it was done at 60 different trial sites and then many, many countries contributed and hoping that remdesivir made a difference. Again, the endpoint would be mortality, but we did not find a mortality benefit, but there was some improvement here in the duration of disease, especially in those patients who were on oxygen. What does that mean? Patients on oxygen mean they are already hypoxemic. That means they do have some inflammatory process going on. So those are the ones who benefited. Those who were not on oxygen, those who were on mechanical ventilation or even ECMO did not benefit at all. So it became clear that there is a little bit of benefit for those who are on oxygen starting remdesivir. So again, this is a secondary uh, point. It was not the primary endpoint. It was a secondary one that it shortened the duration of uh, illness. And again, the FDA said, okay, fine. Um, we'll give you another authorization. Uh, take it from hydroxychloroquine, give it to remdesivir. But again, it's an emergency use authorization. It is not a full approval, but it says it is okay to use for now. And it was distributed on a compassionate use uh, uh, basis. But the WHO said, wait a minute, and people are still dying with remdesivir. Remdesivir didn't really uh, do a thing for us. So let's test it uh, through a, a trial. So they did the solidarity trial and they actually looked at remdesivir and they found out that remdesivir really didn't have any effect on anything. It did not even uh, benefit the disease, the symptomatology, uh, oxygen needs, uh, mechanical ventilation needs. So only on the 20th of November, and I just read that last week, uh, the WHO came up with a recommendation not to use remdesivir in COVID-19 patients. We're still using it, by the way. It's still the only thing we have, remdesivir dexamethasone. But this is the position of the WHO. Now, we turned into other arms. We said, okay, we'll look into our immune system. We'll try to suppress th something here. We think that most of the devastating, uh, uh, damaging effect is coming from this interaction of the cyto, uh, cytokines. So let's block interferon alpha, interferon beta. Didn't work. Don't have enough information to make any recommendations to use in COVID-19 patients. So we said, okay, fine. Let's find a monoclonal antibody that would specifically go and attack the virus. But wait a minute. We've been using IVIG for so many diseases in the past that are auto-mediated. Can we use the same thing? And then the answer was no, it has to be specific, monoclonal antibody that would attack a specific part of the virus. And the target for everyone now is that S protein spike that enables the virus to gain entry into the cell. If we can block that area, then maybe game is over for the virus. 
So here is the trial, the Blaze One trial, and this monoclonal antibody they call it LY CoV triple five, and they say they got some good results. Okay, again it's randomized, and there is some separation as you can see here, starting in day two and lasting all the way till like day nine, and then the curve starts to tighten again. So who knows? But anyway, symptomatology, symptoms wise, patients felt a little bit better. So that was something promising. But the big thing here that gave this medicine a blessing is that hospitalization with this monoclonal antibody was much less in the intervention group. So again, <laughs> the FDA being so desperate, the issue of that green card again, and they say, okay, take the authorization on an emergency basis. However, it is not standard of care, will not be offered to everyone. It will be offered to those who are deemed to be at high risk for developing complications from COVID-19. All right, so now we continue to look into our immune system. What else, what, what else can we target in the process of the immune reactivity? Steroids, of course, you know, this is the old uh, uh, immune modulator that we've been using for years for many of the autoimmune diseases. So would it work for COVID? Yeah, if the thinking is our immune system is rampant and it's out of control and it's causing all the damage, then why not quiet it down or calm it down? So the old method, again, going back to steroids, the World Health Organization analyzed seven randomized trials in a meta-analysis and good news, uh, they came up with this here, happy faces here. Those who are on oxygen means that they did have some sort of damage to the lungs. They were hypoxemic to start with. They benefited a lot. There was reduction in mortality by one third. So that's the first time we hear good news about the management of COVID-19 uh, hospitalized patients. However, those who were not on oxygen did not benefit. So again, maybe they're thinking that those who were not on oxygen were not really that sick. They didn't have a lot of inflammatory changes going on. So steroids didn't have a role to play. But at least we have something now. That's what the rationale for using remdesivir dexamethasone combination. Dexamethasone six milligrams was the dose. But if dexamethasone is not available, you can always equilibrate uh, a different steroid for the same uh, potency. Statins. People talk about statins a lot. And, and statins have been, you know, used in the cardiovascular field for a long time. They have good effects and protective effects, but in COVID-19, they did not prove to be any efficacious. Um, but there is nothing against using them. If a person is using them for cardiac reasons, they should continue. There's no problem uh, with, with that medicine for COVID-19, but it doesn't help. Okay, find another target. You know, Look into this big cascade of inflammation and find another way. So we go after interleukin-1, and anakinra is the medicine. And who do we give it to? People who manifest hyperinflammatory reactions like, you know, high CRPs and, you know, uh, fibrinogen and D-dimers. So they find, they find that there is a little bit of improvement in terms of oxygenation benefits. Uh, nevertheless, we don't have enough information um, to recommend it as a treatment for COVID-19 patients. Here we go to another target, IL-6. Let's block IL-6. So map, similar things. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. You know, X means that we don't have enough information to recommend uh, the medicine for treatment. Now, tocilizumab, and there was a study at UCSD, actually a multi-center study that UCSD was part of, and tocilizumab went on for some time and eventually, again, devastating and frustrating results. Um, so the curve is almost, compatible here. There is no differentiation at all. Uh, did not meet any primary or secondary goals. It didn't make the patient feel better, reduce mortality or anything. So again, tocilizumab uh, joins the list of medications in the basket. Out. So we go to another target, uh, tyrosine kinase. Let's suppress that. And we bring this medicine here and until now still going clinical trials and we don't have inf enough information to make any recommendation either for or against. Same thing for genus kinase inhibitors. So as you can see, it's been a devastating uh, path uh, towards recovery and uh, combating the virus. Uh, some people are not talking about mesenchymal stem cells, but there is a strong warning from the FDA that it can only be, uh, can be dangerous and it can be uh, harmful and it's illegal. Uh, anticoagulation, Dr. Adel talked about anticoagulation uh, in uh, COVID-19 patients yesterday, so I will not uh, spend time on that. But the recommendation is everyone who comes into the hospital with COVID-19 obviously gets the prophylactic dose of uh, either low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. 
Um, there is no recommendation to go look for DVTs if the patient is not symptomatic. Just because they have uh, uh, COVID-19 doesn't mean he has to get ultrasounds and stuff like that. I would put him on prophylaxis and that's about it. Uh, there is no recommendation to either increase the dose unless the patient is obese, obviously, uh, or give thrombolytics. Uh, no indication to give thrombolytics for thromboembolic prophylaxis. Obviously for treatment, it's a different story. Uh, nitric oxide, uh, okay, it's a rescue medicine, you know, ARDS, PF ratio less than 100, there's not much you can do. You can try it out, but you get tachyphylaxis in about four or five days, and it's very expensive too, and very hard to use. It's not available everywhere. Now, lots of uh, myth or things in the media, a lot of people are popping up, you know, vitamin C and vitamin D and zinc and magnesium and so many things. Uh, does it really work? Uh, there was a couple of studies on vitamin C. Two said, yeah, there is a little bit of benefit. The two others said, no, there's no benefit. So who knows? Uh, nobody can make a recommendation at this point. Vitamin C combination with thiamine, with or without steroids. People are trying different things. Now, vitamin D, we know that uh, vitamin D has receptors on the immune cells. So people thought that maybe it's immune modulator and it can actually improve uh, immune function. Um, but, you know, through the studies, Again, we don't have any information to make a recommendation whether to take it or not take it uh, for the sake of COVID-19. Zinc, however, there is a recommendation not to take zinc over the daily requirement uh, dose uh, because long-term uh, taking of uh, large dose of zinc can suppress your copper level and then produce uh, lots of side effects like anemia and uh, neuromuscular problems. ASA inhibitors, there was a lot of talk because again, that is the receptor that the virus is using, is using to get into the cell. So by using ASA inhibitors, do we have upregulation of the uh, uh, receptors? A lot of people said, don't use it. And then eventually through the trials, ASA inhibitors can be used, ARBs can be used, especially if they are used for cardiac reasons. They don't affect COVID-19 one way or the other. Influenza, people can get co-infected with COVID and influenza. So it's influenza season, you need to check for both. Um, and influenza vaccine needs to be applied. If a person comes into the hospital with symptoms of the flu, even before you check, you put up on Tamiflu empirically, you can stop it if the patient is negative for influenza later on, regardless of the COVID-19 status. Everyone is waiting for a vaccine. And uh, after this you know, devastating uh, journey, trying to find an agent that would actually work against the virus and not being able to, everybody is holding their breath waiting for this magic vaccine. And obviously there's 30 of uh, these vaccines being developed right now. There are so many um, regulatory bodies in the US that are directly involved, including Ministry of Defense. Um, and then Operation Warp Speed was uh, announced by the White House and $10 billion uh, uh, dedicated by the Congress to come up with these vaccines. Uh, does anyone know this guy? Uh, this guy is Monsif Salawi, and he's from Morocco, Arabi Hoa, and he is the chief advisor for the whole campaign of developing uh, the vaccines in the US. He was appointed by President Trump. Uh, he's here with the president, and uh, this is him on CNN talking about vaccine development. He really made me uh, very proud and now the types of vaccines uh, that we are going to be looking into. Now, this old model here, the inactivated virus, you know, this has been known to the medical society for a long time. You get a virus, you kill it or inactivate it somehow, and you put it into the system, and then the immune system will react to it and produce antibodies. Now, uh, this company here is working uh, on this methodology called the Sinovac Biotech. It's a German company. And they claim that they have been uh, producing good numbers of neutralizing antibodies, up to 90%, and they have good results. There's an ongoing trial now in Brazil involving more than 8,000 people, phase three. Uh, Protein-based vaccine. Basically, I will take that little protein, which is protein S, try, try to get it into the cell somehow, and have the cell manufacture antibodies against it. That's the, uh, uh, the method uh, uh, that the Sanofi and GlaxoSmith is uh, working on. Now, this is a new thing here, the genetic vaccines, the viral uh, vector vaccine. Um, AstraZeneca is using a DNA with inactivated non-replicating adenovirus. So the adenovirus carries that DNA. The DNA is a sequence that will eventually have the cell produce a protein similar to the S spike protein on the virus. 
So adenovirus doesn't replicate, it's not gonna cause a disease, goes to the cell, gets into the cell, that DNA is transcribed, a messenger RNA, RNA is gonna go out to the ribosomes and protein is gonna be synthesized. And that protein is gonna look exactly like the S protein of the virus. So when it is released, the immune system is going to react to it and this is how we get immune without actually being infected with the virus. So that's the technology that AstraZeneca is now using. Now, uh, genetic RNA viruses are just short one step rather than getting DNA and they actually have a transcription of a messenger RNA that is synthesized and it is inoculated into the cell and it's the same mechanism. The uh, nucleus, uh, the ribosomes will uh, form a protein similar to protein S of the virus and when it goes out, it will be immunogenic. So these are the companies and the platforms. Uh, like I said, the Sinovac is uh, producing this inactivated the virus. It produced a good number of antibodies in uh, macaques, which is uh, kind of the monkeys. This is the messenger RNA technology. It's called the 1273. And the company that is leading this now is Moderna. And the Moderna have been in the news in the past week. I don't know if uh, you get the same news in Egypt. But basically uh, producing this messenger RNA, producing the protein S, and then antibodies are going to be forming to attack the virus. They claim that they had neutralizing serum and ability to actually kill the virus up to 90% of the uh, population tested. Moderna came out and they said they had met the primary efficacy endpoint. Our stuff works and it's very efficacious. 94% 0.5 efficacious they claim. And that is now the beginning of phase three. So they apply for emergency FDA approval for this coronavirus vaccine, which might be available mid-December or late December. And then uh, the uh, US government had offered the company $1.5 billion to come up with 100 million doses of this vaccine. Now, obviously, if you're following the uh, stock market, uh, the stock went up from Moderna more than double. And this is actually a false number. I checked it this morning, it's $150. It used to be like in the 20s and now it's $150. So uh, maybe we missed the boat on investment. <laughs> um, again, BioNTech, which is a German company and Pfizer are working on the same technology, also messenger RNA. And again, the US government had offered them $1.95 million billion to uh, develop vaccine. Uh, the operation warp speed is aiming to produce 300 million vaccines by January 21. This is what the US government has contracted these companies to do. Uh, so this is the AstraZeneca model, the adenovirus that gets the DNA inside the cells. This is my last slide and it says here, my future holds the promise of a good life. We're all hoping to see an end to this pandemic, but nevertheless, we still have to use our masks from now on until there is an effective agent or an effective vaccine. Thank you so much, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Professor Islam, for your excellent expose day. Maybe we have uh, time for questions. I will take the opportunity to start I have two questions actually. Do you use in the USA either Evermectin or combination of Sofotover, Daclatover? And the other question is that while the WHO, after the Solidarity study, said don't use uh, REMT severe, weak or conditional recommendation. And I know in the States, it's difficult to use it after that. Maybe we still use it in Egypt. And that was for all the antiviral. What did the antiviral you use in hospitalized patients, the severe and critical in the United States? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, until today, it is actually very difficult uh, to get authorization to use medications in the US. It has to be issued by the FDA. And like you've seen, uh, even the emergency authorization is given based on certain studies. Remdesivir did show a little bit of shortening of disease and improvement of symptoms. And that was the rationale for this emergency use authorization. Now, it has not been revoked by the FDA. So these are two different societies. You know, WHO feels that the medicine is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. 
Now, through the solidarity study, they did not find the original findings of improving uh, symptoms and shortening the disease. They did not find any positive uh, outcome from the remdesivir. That's why they made the, uh, the recommendation. Nevertheless, the body that is uh, charged with given licenses is the FDA. So regardless of what the WHO says, is, it remains an opinion. But the regulatory body is the FDA. And as long as the FDA continues to give this authorization to remdesivir, it will continue to be utilized. Now, one thing we do at UCSD or other hospitals uh, as an individual physician, we do not get to uh, dictate or choose what we treat the patients with. It has to be policy across the campus. So when uh, tocilizumab was coming out and remdesivir and all these things, we were not authorized, even though we had the medicine available for trial patients. So only during uh, the clinical trial, we were supposed to use the medicine. But as a physician, I didn't have the liberty to use this medicine because the whole campus had a policy that did not approve the use of these medications. Um, so the only antiviral medicine that is now in use in the U.S. is remdesivir, uh, despite the uh, recommendation that came out of the WHO uh, recently. Okay. Question from Professor Nivi. Um, just uh, as a continuation, for how long do you use it? I mean, do you use it for five days only, or do you extend it till 10 days? We do 10 days. We do 10 days for all patients, irrespective right. to the response? No, obviously, you know, you can tailor it to your, your patient's response and stuff. But, you know, it, it's been a practice because especially those who are not getting better, you, you don't want to come like halfway and say, oh, I'm going to stop the medicine now. Uh, it's going to have some legal uh, ramifications. You know, families are going to be asking you, you know, why did you do that? And what is the rationale of stopping the medicine? You cannot just say because I don't feel it's working. Um, as long as the FDA has this authorization and it's distributed and it's hospital policy to give it to patients who are on oxygen, on mechanical vents, uh, then we're going to continue to, to do that. Yeah, it's according to the protocol. I mean, recently there was a guideline from the Imperial College London and they said it it's really, uh, you, you need to evaluate after 72 hours, and if he's not responding, maybe you can stop it. So, Right. We had stopped it when patients developed renal failure, you know, liver problems and stuff, uh, but that was a different indication. Okay. Um, thank you. Anyone else? You hear me? Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Ibrahim for this uh, elegant, uh, comprehensive review on the diagnosis and management of the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to ask about another uh, aspect uh, always related to the COVID-19. Uh, be because, uh, because of this pandemic, all our efforts were diverted away from uh, the care and the diagnosis of many other important diseases as well. Professor Safa talked uh, this morning that, for instance, the diagnosis and the treatment of many patients with lung cancer has been delayed. Uh, one of the solutions that uh, was proposed, the implementation of the telemedicine approaches. So I would like to hear uh, your uh, opinion about this during this era. If you have any experience with this in the US, and I take the opportunity to ask uh, my professors and the chairpersons if we can develop the telemedicine approach, particularly during this uh, COVID era. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Don, uh, telemedicine, I, I have been a fan of telemedicine from the early time. And I, as you know, and I used to do work in Saudi Arabia, I haven't been able to do that for about a year or so because of the travel restrictions. Like in Anna, I always conducted ICU rounds um, on a computer with, with Zoom and other platforms. Um, I, I think it's the way of the future. And even after we find the resolution to this problem of COVID-19, I, I don't think the world is going to go back to what it was before. I think a lot of people discovered that they can actually do virtually and digitally a lot of the things that required for them to be um, on site. Uh, when it comes to medicine, obviously, as a physician, you really have to have hands on, touch your patients, talk to them face to face and stuff. But currently, I'm using a system called Vigo, which is actually a robot that I can control. And I have fun controlling it with, with my iPhone. I sit there, put in a program, and I can actually drive it through the hallway of the hospital. And I go to the emergency room and I go to the rooms and talk to the families and talk to uh, patients. Um, and I'm doing this while I'm sitting in one ICU and I'm, you know, covering patients in a different ICU. As you know, not every ICU in the U.S. has the 24-hour coverage as required by the leapfrog. 
So a lot of hospitals resort to telemedicine and the tele-ICU has been known in the U.S. for the past 15 years or so. Um, I enjoy it. I think it's, uh, you know, given the circumstances, it's probably the safest way to communicate uh, with patients. Um, in the COVID-19 patients' rooms, we have cameras, uh, you know, two-way cameras that we communicate with the staff. So not every time you need to do something, you have to get into the room because, again, you have to put all the full PPEs and that's a waste. So you try to minimize the times you go in and out. So we use these robots to actually go in and do most of the work for us. Um, so telemedicine, I, I think it's coming up. I don't think it's going to go away even after COVID-19 goes away. I think tele telemedicine and the tele ICU is the way of the future. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Islam, and hope uh, to see you near, very near, shortly. Thank you very much. I saw the Dr. Tariq in the audience. I sent him the invitations. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much.